Hi, this is the Tropical Tidbit for Saturday evening, September 24th. As always, the thoughts in this video are mine alone, and in making decisions, consult the National Hurricane Center and your local weather office for the best information. Our survey of the Atlantic today remains busy, but some storms are drawing to a close. This is ex-Hurricane Fiona at the top of your screen, which went through a powerful extratropical transition and hooked into Nova Scotia, now turning toward the northeast as it begins to decay, but still in the process of providing severe impacts to a large region of southeastern Canada. And hopefully everyone scrapes by with just some power outages, but everyone stays safe during the remainder of this storm event. We also have Tropical Storm Gaston now moving on from the Azores Islands where it provided tropical storm conditions to the region and is now moving westward and beginning to weaken with less thunderstorm activity and will continue dissipating over the next few days. And finally, Tropical Storm Hermine, uh, which is also in the process of decaying quickly as it moves into cooler and more stable air and cooler water as it moves slowly toward the north and then probably toward the west and will not reach the Canary Islands, but there is heavy rain moving that direction nonetheless on the northeast side. And finally, a tropical wave still being watched in the central Atlantic, not developing, still weak, dry air and stability limiting it so far, and it's not moving anywhere quickly, so no threat to land, and we won't be talking about that today. What we are going to spend the entire video on is Tropical Storm Ian in the central Caribbean, which now looks much more like a bona fide tropical storm today. This is the zoomed in view. You can see Jamaica just at the top of your screen there for reference. And the big difference between today and yesterday is that we don't have an exposed low level circulation. Instead, we can see that the view is obscured by thunderstorms and the low level center is somewhere under here. And it looks like it's probably trying to consolidate somewhere in the center of this area, just to the southeast of this big convective burst on the northwest side. It's been a little bit chaotic on the recon data today. The plane went in there and early on found a couple of potential areas of rotation, even some wind shifts down here, and it wasn't clear exactly where the center of circulation was. They found northerly wind here, and then suddenly they went up here and found southeasterly wind later, and then another area of rotation farther to the west. It does appear that this one may eventually become dominant because it's stacked right underneath the area of mid-level rotation. It's right here uh, on the satellite loop. You can see the, the maximum visual rotation on these clouds is roughly in here, and the clouds that we're seeing on this loop are, are mostly mid-level. And that's right where the recon kind of found that new center underneath. So I suspect this will likely become dominant. The strongest winds are in this burst of convection on the northwest side. You can see here there was a, a little area of 40 mile per hour winds or so, but most of these winds are 30 miles per hour or under that over this broad area here. So the system is a little discombobulated for now, but the, the reason that this is looking like a more bonafide tropical storm today with convection over the center is due to the decreasing wind shear that we talked about. There's no longer a strong northeasterly push on the system and that has weakened dramatically compared to yesterday. So as we've been talking about for a few days now, Conditions are ripe for Ian to strengthen as it moves toward the northwest here to the south of Jamaica into the northwestern Caribbean, and rapid intensification is likely at some point within a couple of days. This is a microwave pass from GPM just to illustrate that there is an area of curvature in the convection uh, illustrated right where the, the recon had that center, just some wrapping banding here. You can see the structure starting to take shape. Looks like it may consolidate right in there. So in terms of the track forecast, we've seen a bit of a shift in the modeling farther west today in light of the fact that Ian is consolidating a little bit farther southwest than at least some of the models expected. For example, this is the European model showing where it has Ian centered this afternoon. But if you go back to the last few runs, you'll see that during the past couple of days, it's been farther to the northeast than it currently is. So where Ian actually is a little bit farther southwest here. Again, it's not a huge difference, but as we've been talking about for the last couple of videos, this makes all the difference going forward in the track. If we now look at the European model, it's moving to the southwest of Grand Cayman, which is right here. The model was going over or east of Grand Cayman before. And if we follow this up into the western end of Cuba by Tuesday afternoon, we have it right here, and if we look at the model run from Thursday afternoon at the same time, the forecast from Thursday afternoon for Tuesday, we see the storm farther northeast uh, near the Florida Keys or in the Florida Straits here. And so this is following the pattern that we've been talking about where the farther northeast the system tracked near Jamaica and the Cayman Islands 
the faster it would arrive in the vicinity of Cuba and Florida and the farther east it would go. But if it goes farther west and south initially, that holds true going forward as well. And it's also slower to arrive in the Gulf of Mexico. So if we look at the GFS, it arrives in the Gulf of Mexico uh, a little bit later, reaching the latitude of the Keys by Wednesday and at a much farther west kind of track than the European model has it. And certainly farther west than some of the runs that were going straight into the Florida Peninsula just a day or two ago. Now there is a lot of spread here. We can see where the GFS is on Tuesday afternoon. The European model is still significantly farther east. So I think some of these trends in the initial position of Ian are still working their way into the models, although the European has corrected its current position right now, some of that data is still working its way through the model cycles. So this evening and tomorrow morning, I suspect we'll see a little bit of a narrowing in the model guidance, at least that's the hope, so we have some greater confidence. But right now the trend is positive for Jamaica. You may get away with just some rain from this and not much else. And then for Grand Cayman, really watching for any kind of westward a jog here in the track because we've gone from showing a direct hit on some of these models to near misses and in the case of the GFS a really strong hurricane where the core passes well to the west of the island there would still be tropical storm conditions there in a case like this but not a major hurricane strike which is good news so far and let's hope that continues now as we continue into the Gulf of Mexico part of the hurricanes track uh, it's really going to depend on the launching point again you know euros here gfs is here this means all the difference for the gulf coast in florida because you know the florida peninsula is oriented like this the difference between a track that's here versus just a little bit farther west means a huge difference in the location along the coastline of any kind of potential landfall so because of the geography you know it's kind of hard to to talk about specific landfall points in florida but because we have seen a slightly westward shift in the modeling today, there's been a corresponding shift in the consensus expectation for where the storm could impact the state of Florida. Looking at the 500 millibar chart from the European model Tuesday afternoon, again, here's where this model has the storm over western Cuba by this time. And the big constant on all these model runs has been this huge long wave trough in the upper levels over the northeastern U.S. that's causing a break in the steering ridge where we have a, a ridge to the east of Ian imparting a southerly steering flow ushering the storm northward and we have another ridge over Texas in the southwest which is imparting a weak northerly flow in the mid-levels in the western gulf. In between there's a lane where the storm is trying to come north due to the presence of this big trough over the northeast U.S. Now on the European uh, this trough lingers for a little bit longer than on the GFS. You see this piece remain dug in over West Virginia. And so this steering ridge to the east is in combination with the trough yanking this northeastward and into the Florida Peninsula ultimately on this particular model run in the vicinity of Tampa. But it really kind of crawls up the coastline here on this particular run. Whereas if we look at the GFS, we have the same big giant trough here, but the details on the trough are just a little bit murky in ways that make this complicated. Now, there's two things going on here. One is that the storm is coming up from a farther westerly position, so it is not over Cuba to start. So to begin with here, it's farther west, which means as this trough digs, its ability to reach the storm and tug it across Florida that influence is lessened if the storm is farther west to begin with. So the storm will be slower to come north and also farther west. There's another detail about the trough, though, that's different. On the GFS, this trough actually pulls out a little bit faster than it does on the Euro, which holds on for just a little bit longer. Let's see if we can find a spot here, maybe on Tuesday morning or sorry, Thursday morning. So yeah, there you go. The trough pulling out on the GFS there, whereas on the Euro, you see it's still a little bit farther back here, just enough to pull on the storm a little bit more than the GFS. So the timing and evolution of this big trough is key in this particular situation. But again, the position of the storm is big too. It's going to be slower as a general rule. If it's farther west, such as the GFS, it will take longer to come north and it will also be farther west in the end. So on the GFS, we're not even talking about the Florida Peninsula anymore. We're talking about the Gulf Coast, moving up in this case to the western Florida Panhandle. It's not a huge distance from here to here, but again, because of the geography of the coastline, that kind of 150, 200 mile shift 
really changes everything in terms of where on the U.S. coastline the hurricane makes landfall. So like we talked about yesterday, it was important not to focus on the details of the first NHC forecast, which was into the Florida Peninsula pretty far south, but the range of possibilities extended well to the west, and we are seeing a shift west in the model guidance in general today. This is a look at some of the uncertainties from the perspective of the ensemble systems, which give us a really great idea about what the realistic possibilities are in a situation. This is the European ensemble, which has you know, corrected farther west now that we see where Ian is south of Jamaica. You see a great many members still move into western Cuba, but there is a group that is farther south and ends up kind of close to the Yucatan Peninsula as well. And so we end up with quite a spread. The members that go over Cuba move north faster and still take kind of that original NHC track into the southern Florida Peninsula. But we have a group that remains off the peninsula for longer and then a group that hangs even farther back and is much slower to come up. So you'll see that the spread only increases. The members that cross the peninsula end up here by Thursday afternoon. And then there's a group that kind of crawls up the western coastline of Florida, and then yet another group that ends up moving into the north Gulf Coast. So quite a bit of spread here, wide area that could theoretically see the hurricane moving in by the latter part of next week. If we look at the GFS, this has been the model that has, for the moment, been right about the short-term track of Ian. Shows a spread as well, a little bit farther west in general than the Euro farther uh, west of Cuba in general in the mean. And then as we move up, we do see some members moving into the Florida Peninsula, but now the majority stay out over the Gulf for a longer time. And we see them kind of drifting northward toward the Gulf Coast. And some of them even hang back for a much longer time, even going into next weekend, some are still meandering over the central Gulf. And that's because as this trough pulls out on the GFS, if the hurricane hasn't made it this far and is still down here for some reason, the steering currents are suddenly quite weak because the trough is gone. So the hurricane could move more slowly than anticipated in some outcomes. Now, we need to talk about the intensity forecast in, and how it relates to this track forecast because we've talked about the uncertainty in the track, but there's actually three distinct scenarios that can occur with the intensity as a result. And it centers around the presence of that big trough. If we look at the 200 millibar flow, so in the upper levels on the GFS ensemble mean, Tuesday afternoon, the model has it in the Yucatan channel. You'll see that the base of the trough is up here. It's kind of off your screen, but you can see the strong jet that results in the upper levels on the base of that trough. And you can see the subtropical jet kind of comes across the northern Gulf of Mexico and then merges into that trough. So we have a strong zone of southwesterly flow. Now let's assume for a minute that the storm crosses western Cuba and makes a move toward the Florida Peninsula. In that eventuality, the storm would be optimally positioned relative to this jet streak to allow strong outflow in the upper levels and it would actually favor intensification of the hurricane during its approach toward the Florida Peninsula. But if the storm is a little bit farther west, it's not going to hit the peninsula first. It's going to take longer to get farther north before hitting land. So in this case, like on the GFS, you'll see that it starts moving into this zone of southwesterly flow. So wind shear starts increasing to a prohibitive level. And the reason it's so bad is because not only do we have southwesterly flow aloft, but we have the opposite at the bottom because behind that big trough to the north is a big surface high. And that's driving northeasterly winds offshore of the Gulf Coast. That's the exact opposite of the upper level flow at this level. So that change with height is a very strong shear zone over 40 knots in some of the model runs that we've seen. So on the GFS, for example, if we look at the hurricane get real strong in this part of the Gulf where conditions are optimal, as soon as it comes north, watch what happens. That pressure number starts rising and we start seeing dry air in the core. The storm gets completely sheared on its way toward the coast due to that really strong shear. And it's all because it took so long to come north and it's much farther north at the landfall point than somewhere down here. If it's down here at landfall, it could be quite strong. If it's up here at landfall, maybe there's room for weakening to occur because conditions get significantly more hostile for the hurricane in that eventuality. If the hurricane were to linger farther south like some of those ensemble members and take an even longer time to come north and even farther west then it becomes more complicated and we wouldn't really know what would happen because the shear zone could shift out of the way and maybe if it's hanging back here at this time 
perhaps conditions get a little bit better as this jet lifts north and some of those members are still over water at that time. And then that would be, you know, we're, we're talking about seven, eight days out. Uh, we would have to deal with that if that's what happens. But right now, the GFS is saying it could hit hostile conditions on the way toward the coast. So after all that, this is the official forecast from the NHC at 5 p.m. Eastern time this evening. And just zooming out here and talking about the big picture, what we know about Ian today is the storm is organizing and a little bit farther southwest than originally expected relative to Jamaica, which is good. We've seen a cancellation of the tropical storm watch. Uh, we do now have a hurricane warning for Grand Cayman, but the trends have been good for you guys as well with the track a little bit farther away from the island, but strong conditions still expected, but maybe not the eye wall of the developing hurricane based on current trends. We are expecting rapid intensification here. Conditions will be basically optimal for a major hurricane to develop in rapid fashion as the system moves through the Northwestern Caribbean and then on into the Southern Gulf of Mexico where conditions will remain very favorable up until about this line here. Once the hurricane gets north of this line, conditions get much less favorable and it's possible we'll see some weakening. How much weakening will depend on how long the hostile environment is allowed to act upon the storm, causing it to degrade. So if the system moves into South Florida, it could hit at a stronger intensity because there's less time for it to weaken. But if it moves into the Gulf Coast instead, there's more time for it to decay so it could be a weaker storm. But it's important to realize too that even if it is a weakening hurricane on its way into the Gulf Coast, this is an extremely storm surge prone area and storm surge does not correlate directly with how fast the max winds come down and it could be a huge impact event even if it's not a Cat 4 hurricane, which is what NHC is forecasting it to be here and here and then weakening a little bit to category two or so. And, and right now, you know, these details still not ironed out. Remember the NHC forecast from 24 hours ago when I did my last video was over Fort Myers. Now they're on the edge of the cone. So you can see the shift that we've had in the track since that time, now showing it going into the Big Bend. And there's no guarantee that it's not gonna shift back toward the east. So really, if you're anywhere in the Florida Peninsula, you're feeling a little better if you're in Southeast Florida. But really, realistically, the entire peninsula could still see impacts and the Panhandle as well, which is now becoming the focus of the new model consensus as we've seen that west shift today. So everyone needs to prepare, including farther west of the cone too, because just in case we see farther shifts to the west, in general, the rule here is the farther west it is entering the Gulf, the farther west the ultimate landfall point will be, and the slower it is here, also the farther west it will be. We saw some of those ensemble members lingering over this region, and it could take until next weekend to get to the Gulf Coast if those kinds of solutions verify. Right now, the timing is expected to be midweek, Wednesday, Thursday, when impacts begin for the southeastern U.S., but there's uncertainty both in the timing and location here. We just know that it's, you know, this general area for now. We've seen some shifting around, but we're getting the storm to form and consolidate in the area that we were watching, this longitude of Jamaica I've been talking about. This is the time when we start to gain, hopefully, some more confidence going forward. So by the time I do my next video for you tomorrow morning, Hopefully we'll have extra information that can help narrow this down a little bit. But for now, it's all about being prepared just in case and having a plan ready to go in case the storm does move your direction. That's it for now, everyone. Thanks for watching.